All right, I see people joining us in the Zoom room here. It is filling up with participants. Go ahead and open up your chat box and let us know who you are and where you're watching from tonight. Welcome to Football Letter Live. Tonight, we're gonna highlight the game day experience at Beaver Stadium and also welcome Letterman Rich Gardner to the program. Let us know again where you're from, where you're watching from, and uh, you can always share your questions in the Q&A box as well. Jonathan, class of 92, Kevin Lashane from our Aiken Augusta chapter. I see Russ Mitchell from Syracuse. Aurora, Colorado represented, Tanya from Springfield, Virginia. Joe from Cunningham, Pennsylvania, class of 72. Hello, Joe. <laughs> right. <laughs> Hi, Joe. Doug Vaughn from Beaufort, North Carolina. Doug, I hope you're impressed that I pronounced it the right way. We lived uh, just north of there for about 10 years in, in Greenville, North Carolina. Good to see you here tonight. Ed Johnson, right here in State College, class of 66. Roger Williams, class of 73 from Collegeville, Pennsylvania. Roger Williams, I think we owe you an apology. We might have been confusing you with our friend, Roger Williams, who lives right here in State College for the past nine episodes. and. Uh, I'm going to right or wrong here and just uh, welcome you to the show and uh, thank you for participating every week and sorry for the confusion there. Dean Van Fleet, a great volunteer out there in California in the Bay Area joining us. Chancer. Hi, Dick. Oh, Dick hey. Chancer, yeah. Lori. <laughs> Roger Williams claiming he is the real Roger Williams. Yes, <laughs> yes, you are. Where else would you rather be than a Zoom full of Penn Staters? I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association, and welcome to Football Letter Live. Tonight, we highlight the game day experience at Beaver Stadium and also welcome Letterman Rich Gardner into the program a little bit later on. We're encouraging you to share your questions for our hosts and guests tonight. You can use the Q&A feature on your Zoom toolbar or ask them in the comments on Facebook Live. Again, I'm joined by John Black, the editor of the Football Letter. John, good evening. How are you? Good evening, Paul. I'm great. Hope you are too. I am doing, I'm doing fantastic. It is, uh, the Big Ten West is in disarray with Wisconsin once again, having to cancel another football game the second week in a row. Uh, but we're worried about the Big Ten East and looking ahead to Maryland, who is our opponent this weekend. John, as you look ahead to the game, what are some of the keys? Well, Paul, as I look ahead, um... Cognizant of the fact that Penn State beat Maryland 59 to nothing just a year ago down the, in College Park and uh, 163 to six cumulative score over the last three years. But I think uh, Maryland's gonna be a much different team this, this, uh, this year. Uh, and actually Maryland has one more win than Penn State right now. So we, you know, gotta be mindful of that. 45 to 44 overtime victory last week over at home over Minnesota uh, after the week before uh, losing 43 to three out at the Northwestern. But uh, I think that uh, Maryland's biggest weakness and one that uh, Penn State ought to be attacking is their run defense. They actually rank, rank last in the big 10 right now and uh, 102nd in the nation in rushing defense. So I think this is the time for our veteran offensive line to play up to their potential and get some running room for those three remaining uh, youngsters that uh, have a lot of talent, but uh, haven't been uh, tested very much this year after uh, not expecting to play nearly as much as they're being asked to here at the beginning of the year. But I think if uh, we can get our run game going against Maryland's defense, that's gonna 
put us in, in charge. The second key, of course, though, that I have to point out is that uh, I'm going to call him uh, Tago Vailoa, the younger uh, first year quarterback at uh, Maryland, just like his older brother. Uh, he had a fantastic uh, game last week, uh, completed 26 out of 35 passes for 340 and 394 yards, three touchdowns. And he brought the Terps uh, back from a 17 point uh, deficit in the fourth quarter. So our defensive line must get more pressure on him than they did on Justin Fields uh, last week. And of course, our secondary play needs to be a lot tighter on the Terrapin receivers than uh, they were on the Buckeyes last week. But I think those are the two keys, our rushing, getting our rushing offense going so that we can run a balanced uh, attack offensively and then getting pressure on this young quarterback and uh, playing his uh, receivers to the point that uh, we interrupt their uh, passing game, which was their, has been their, uh, their big key this year offensively. Now, I'd, I'd say barring any on-field problems, shall we say, like turnovers, uh, excessive penalties, or uh, perhaps even an injury, Penn State should get its first win of the season uh, on Saturday and start a victory string that uh, I think could continue through the rest of the season. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. Um... You know, it's uh, if recent history holds true, it should be a big another big win over the Maryland Terrapins. Uh, you know, we're going to talk to some people tonight, John, that are uh, responsible for the in stadium environment, right? The spirit squads. We're going to talk to PJ Mullen in just a second. Right. But I got to tell you, the Goodyear blimp being in State College this past weekend, those wonderful aerial shots of Beaver Stadium, and as they zoom down into the S zone. I thought the S zone looked fantastic. I liked the, uh, I liked all the cardboard cutouts that, that surrounded it. Um, but, but the S zone was uh, prominently featured all over uh, national television. And again, that's something that the alumni association along with lion ambassadors and our blue white society sponsored. And, and that's actually a great picture that Mel has up there on the screen where you, right. as you zoom closer in, you can see the names of the members of the class of 2020 and the class of 2021 uh, featured on that banner. And so again, just another way that we honor those two classes. Uh, but we're also planning a, a game day prize pack contest uh, for each members um, for each home game week. And to enter, just visit our Instagram page uh, our Instagram page is at Penn State alums, uh, which is right here on the screen. And actually, I have a couple of the items right here, which you're probably not going to be able to see because of my virtual background. But you get this great clear stadium bag. You get a, a shaker in there, um, a great. Uh, this is probably the coup de grace of the prize pack is an S zone T-shirt. So go on out there. Uh, and uh, click on uh, the post at the top uh, with the S Zone t-shirt to learn more. Again, visit our Instagram page at, at Penn State Alums. Click on the post at the top with the S Zone t-shirt to learn more details about how you can get into the running for this week's prize pack. So John, let's welcome our guests uh, in right now. Like I said, we have members representing our spirit squad the Lionettes and Penn State's Director of Marketing. Uh, first, the head coach of Penn State Spirit Squad, Curtis White. Curtis, welcome to Football Letter Live. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. It's good to see you. Uh, joining Curtis is Julie Berardi. She is the head coach of the Lionettes, three-time national champion Penn State Lionettes. And then <laughs> PJ Mullen uh, is Penn State's Director of Marketing. PJ, welcome to Football Letter Live. Hey everybody, how are we doing? We're great. We are oh, doing great. You know, I had together, my camera all set, Paul, and now it's looking bad again. There we go. It, it, it is looking, looking dark bad. again. <laughs> hey, a good craftsman never blames his tools, PJ. Correct. I'll fix that right now. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you guys help create a rocking atmosphere uh, in Beaver Stadium. Uh, let's first start with Curtis and Julie. Can you share some insight into um, the kind of the mission of the spirit squad and the lionettes and, and what do you hope to, 
what do you hope the students get out of that experience? And what are you looking for during tryouts as you, as you build your teams? Um, for the cheerleading team, what we aim for our mission is to um, keep the Penn State traditions and school spirit alive and strong. Um, and in terms of what we um, hope that students get out of the program and what we get out of the team is um, we want our team members to enhance their connection with Penn State because they come to us as young students, um, develop strong relationships with the team, um, create lifelong friends, um, learn new collegiate skills that they can look back once they graduate and say, I can't believe that I was able to do that. You know, some of our guys are always amazed when they can hold a woman up in the air with one arm and not drop her. So it's always pretty exciting when they're able to do that. And our goal is just to um, make sure that they know the importance of being a Penn State cheerleading cheerleader, their value to the athletic department, and um, also to create a national standard in terms of the school spirit that we create at our athletic events. Yeah, and just piggybacking off of what Kurt said on the dance side, um, you know, we're on the same page. We want our students to be ambassadors for the university. We always have this saying where you need to represent Penn State, whether you're in and out of uniform, whether you're in state college or at the Fiesta Bowl, um, you know, we want to spread that Penn State spirit. Um, also hope um, to have a national presence in addition to our presence um, at game day and compete against other um, collegiate dance teams across the country. We're going to talk about the competition side in just a second, uh, but I'm going to turn it over to John Black here. Uh, Truly, how, how would you say that the spirit squad and the dance squad work with one another and complement each other in carrying out their mission uh, of representing so, Penn State? Yeah, um, the Penn State dance team and cheer squad have always been a tight knit group um, dating back to um, when I was on the team 2004 to 2008. Um, and it's kind of grown even more. Since around 2015, um, Dance and Cheer moved under the same spirit umbrella led by Curtis. Right. Since then, Curtis and I have been able to collaborate on a lot of things. Um, one example would be at game day for all the fight songs, um, Cheer and Dance now do the same choreography so that we're on the same page. Um, and also back in 2018, the dance team decided to switch to compete at the same nationals competition that Cheer competes at so that we can travel as a united Penn State spirit group and support each other um, at Penn State and at nationals. Where are those nationals held? Um, Orlando, Florida. All right. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I think that's a piece of um, kind of the hidden piece, if you will, around cheer and dance, right? Uh, everyone sees the, the public piece, they see in Beaver Stadium and and uh, the great spirit that you're able to generate amongst the fans in the stadium. What they don't probably see as often is the competition side, the actual, the sports side of, um, of dance and of, of cheer. Curtis, talk a little bit about the competition side and, um, and how you all prepare for the competition season. So our students, um, as soon as they try out for the team, we start getting them mentally ready for a competition. Um, we usually have tryouts in the late spring and competition is um, in January of the following year. So we tell them to make sure over the summer that they're focusing on keeping their skills strong while they're at home. Um, we send them workouts. We have them come back to University Park over the summer to work on skills. We do that a few times during the summer. And um, we also take them away to camp. So the um, Lionettes will go to a dance camp that's usually held in Wisconsin and cheerleading will go to a cheerleading camp that has been held in Wisconsin and also in Scranton, Pennsylvania. And so we um, really focus on the athleticism side in terms of getting them ready for the tryouts. Julie, same, same for your team? Yeah, pretty much the same. Um, you know, we have our tryouts in the spring. Um, we usually have around 30 members and only about half of them are able to compete. Um, that's just the rules of the competition. So we try out um, in the fall um, to be a part of the nationals team. Um, and again, just focusing on athleticism and skills, um, 
you know, kind of coincides with the football and basketball seasons. So um, we're really busy, but it just shows how great the students are at managing their time. Yeah. How, how do each of you see, uh, the, how do you feel that the students have responded to these COVID times and what, uh, uh, how, how do you keep them interacting with alumni and fans and what do you, what do you see on the horizon uh, coming up next year, shall we say? So I think overall, the, the students have been trying to um, keep a positive twist to all of this that's happening. One of the talks that I had with the team is I um, tried to remind them that during difficult times, we have to remember that we are the spirit team at Penn State. So if anyone should be positive, it should be us. And so <laughs> in some way, you've got to find a positive way to handle all of this. And we know it's difficult times, but um, we've got to figure out a way to work through it and make sure it's a positive attitude. Um, one of the things that we've done with our team too is we have a very strong booster club for the cheerleading and dance team and the Eli mascot. And so they've um, paid for memberships for our team members so that they can do some team bonding things like lift together at a gym in State College. They go to kickboxing class. Um, we have had light practices to keep them in contact with one another. They've been doing virtual performances for different um, organizations around campus. And also, um, you know, this past weekend, we got them involved in college game day. So it was a way to keep them excited and fun during these um, troubling times. I thought, I thought that was a great representation in college game yeah. day. They did a super job there. So uh, inside Beaver Stadium, there, uh, Beaver Stadium is always rocking, right? Uh, PJ, you um, always get the fans in the right mood by, by playing, playing the right music at the right time. Um, trying to create a lot of energy in the stadium. But how is that different this year where I, I would imagine like your audience is the 107,000 fans and trying to get them rocking. Now your audience, I would presume, are the players on the field and trying to keep them um, you know, kind of hyped up. Talk a little bit about how you're approaching this season um, in, in ways that might be different than previous seasons. Uh, yeah, first of all, hopefully my audio is working here because my camera seems really off. Is it working? All right, good. Looks I feel good. like I'm in slow motion. Um, first of all, thanks for having us on. We really appreciate it, John and Paul and, and Mel and the Alumni Association. Really excited to get out here and see Curtis and uh, Coach White and Coach Berardi uh, on, on Zoom tonight. Um, but yeah, things are, things are definitely a lot different this year at Beaver Stadium. We're so used to 107,000 people out there going nuts and singing Sweet Caroline or chanting Seven Nation or, you know, the, the cheerleaders and the Lionettes leading, you know, rock and roll for the whole stadium and we are chants. And, and that's just not the case this year. So uh, certainly, certainly different than what we're used to. Um, it would be lying if I said it was as fun. It's not even close to as fun. I was texting that to Greg Drain, the director, Dr. Drain, the director of the, uh, the Blue Band. And I said, this just isn't, it's not the same without all those folks in there. The team's still as prepared and will continue to be as prepared as they, as they always are. But without the pageantry of the cheerleaders and the lionettes and the blue band, and of course, 107,000 fans, it's just not, it's just not as fun. It's not going to be, um, right. you know, but on the bright side, or if you're, if you're trying to be positive about it, uh, it's given us some great opportunities to do other um, engaging items and and things on you know facebook live and twitter live with our fans that we've been able to um really take advantage of and, and have fun with and and connect some of our former uh you know former football players and nfl guys uh, you know we were on the phone with nick scott earlier tonight uh, getting ready for our pregame show for saturday he's going to appear on that um we always look and see who's got the bye week or or who plays in the right. thursday night game and then we kind of attack it that way one of our interns jake currency is our NFL intern. So his job is to uh, make a spreadsheet and keep track on who's got the bye week and who's got the Thursday night game or the Monday night game. And then we kind of attack that way and figure out who's available to come on and talk to us. And, and we have fun with that. Uh, talking to Nick earlier, we were giving him a hard time because Alan Robinson was in the concussion protocol uh, last week right. or so because Nick Scott hit him. Um, and we said, <laughs> we can't have that. Uh, but we, we, we love that. That's fun. And then, and then what you guys were doing at the beginning of this program, when you're asking people where they're checking in from and they're checking in from all over the country, I saw some, some other people on there too. I think Lori, you on here. Who's a former yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, featured uh, blue yeah. Sapphire. 
Um, so just seeing, seeing all those folks check in and, and the, uh, and the roll calls that we do, it's been a lot of fun and it's been super engaging. And, you know, you don't always get to do that when you're out there with 107,000 people, that's just a sea of Penn state fans or in the case of a white out a sea of white. Um, but when you do it online like this, you can see the different people saying, oh, I'm checking in from California or I'm in Germany today, checking in on happy Valley. That's been very exciting. And I could see where that would find a place, you know, in our efforts moving forward. Um, because there's no reason why we only focus on just the fans that are able to be here. Cause we have so many, you know, across the, across the country, across the world, what 600 plus thousand, uh, right. in the alumni network. So that's been, that's been fun and exciting. Well, despite not having the, the huge uh, whiteout crowd last week, uh, which is always such a fantastic uh, uh, atmosphere to have, uh, I do have to, like Paul said, that those uh, shots from above, the aerial shots from the blimp down into Beaver Stadium were just very inspiring uh, last week. And, they, and uh, the, the, the Spirit team had done a great job with the college game day preparations. Yeah, we, we, uh, we got lucky. Uh, number one, our spirit teams were willing to do that stuff with college game day. And that's not necessarily the case across the country. Um, but those kids who, who, you know, were basically told that they're not going to be able to be in Beaver Stadium this year, uh, woke up uh, bright and early on a Saturday and still showed up and, you know, and, and put on a great show for the millions watching college game day. So that was super exciting. And then obviously you see the lion in there and everybody else. So that, that was, that was incredible. Um, with what those coaches were able to pull off with really hardly any practice at all this year and a bunch of kids that I say kids students that um, have been given um, you know we put things in perspective we, we you know we've all been given bad news with COVID but you know when they're preparing especially the seniors uh, to get out there and do it their, their one last time with their buddies um, to have that taken away uh, stinks but they, they got out there they were smiling representing Penn State that you know the way that we we would all hope that they would those cutouts look great. Um, props to, to yes, my boss, fantastic. Chris, Gra Chris Grassi and, and Pete Menez um, for kind of heading that charge. They've done an awesome job uh, getting some fans in there. I know there's some deceased people that are in the stadiums as well. So I know it means a lot to some of the, uh, the Penn State moms and dads out there tuning in whose moms and dads um, aren't with us anymore who are able to watch a game uh, in Beaver Stadium. So again, there's, there's a lot of, there's a silver lining to all this if you think of it that way. Um, I just saw somebody ask Roger, I don't know if it was the real, the real Roger Williams or the fake Roger Williams. Um, but uh, whichever Roger that was, he was asking uh, if Nittanyville was completely out of it this year, the student section, for those of you that aren't aware, that's, that's what we call them as Nittanyville. Um, and they're, they're not out of it. We meet with them, you know, weekly. They made their banners this year. The linebacker U banner has been a tradition for years and years. That's still there. The banners hung up proudly in the south end zone, uh, right in front of where the uh, cheerleaders and the lionettes uh, would typically, uh, you know, stand during during the games and 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 do their thing. Uh, so those banners are in there. Those kids uh, were able to put them together and actually come in and hang those banners up. Which which again, I get it. It's not it's not sitting there and cheering for Sean Clifford and Jahan Dotson and Coach Franklin, but it's uh, it's something. And uh, it means a lot that our students are, are willing and ready to do that stuff because not everybody is right now. A lot of people are lacking that motivation and our, our kids and our students are asking, what more can we do? What more can we do? I mean, I, I talk to Curtis all the time, Coach White, you know, what more can the Mike man do? What more can the Lion do? The cheerleaders? We're always trying to, trying to uh, think of stuff. And, and our pregame show, um, and I'm not doing a shameless plug, so I won't, I'll let Paul give me a shameless plug later for that. But our pregame show on Saturday mornings, the, the, the thought process behind that, John and Paul, is, is to bring Happy Valley to life. These are not, um, you know, your typical bring on Coach Franklin and talk X's and O's or bring in um, one of the players. This is our, it's our military appreciation game coming up. So we're going to have uh, Haley McLean uh, come on, who's one of Curtis's former students, and she's an Air Force a member of the Air Force. She's a former Atlanta Falcon cheerleader. She's living in California now, working with cheerleaders, younger cheerleaders still to this day. And she's in the Air Force. Our former Mike man, uh, Francis Alvarez, he's yeah. down there in Florida, flying jets. He's in the Navy. Um, Mike Valenia, he's our former Nittany Lion. He's coming on. These are all, they're now all military folks. Uh, we'll have them on. We'll have Nick Scott from Los Angeles. We'll have uh, different feature stories around campus with ROTC. Our students are the ones putting on this show. 
So it's not just your X's and O's football show. It's your wake up and see a little bit of Happy Valley. Live shots of Old Main, live shots of the Michael P. Murphy uh, War Plaza, um, those types of things that that people aren't getting to do this year when they can't walk through campus on Saturday mornings and, and see their favorite things with their creamery coffee or ice cream in their hand. So we're trying to bring a little bit of that to the to them virtually for now. And then once we uh, get back into a normal routine, you know, we can take care of more than just the the one sense of seeing it on a on a computer screen bring back the five senses you can smell it feel it and, and taste right. it and all that fun stuff yeah, football football saturday at penn state is far more than just the game itself it's all no the other atmosphere with everybody else participating in the great shows that they put on yeah. i saw roger williams throw one up other uh question up there julie you're probably best for this you said do all the uh lionette dancers have to have long hair like yours <laughs> no <laughs> that's a great question um no, we have no appearance requirements. Um, I've had girls with short hair too. <laughs> so you're saying I got a chance. <laughs> we, we accept males, females, any hair, anything. You know, we look for other things that aren't appearance based. So no requirement at all. Paul, you have so a chance. Another question in the Q&A box uh, for Curtis. Curtis, when you were a cheerleader at Penn State, uh, this is from Dave Uhazy. He thinks that there were about a dozen cheerleaders total uh, when you were there. Now it seems like there are dozens and dozens of um, students involved with the with the spirit squads. Um, how did it grow over over time, and um, how many games do each get to participate in? So um, the reason why it grew over time is um, a lot of um, it is because our athletic department has grown so much. So. Um, Many moons ago, when I was on a team, we just covered. I um, remember. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we just covered football and um, uh, basketball, men's and women's basketball. But now the team covers football, men's and women's basketball, women's volleyball, ice hockey, and um, we'll make some appearances at some other events. And they travel a lot more than we used to, so we had to increase the number of students on the team. Um, and so it's really um, caused our program to expand a lot. Um, probably the one thing that we've never changed and one of the traditions that we keep is we make sure that each year we pick one student who's selected to be the Nittany Lion mascot. And during these changing times with the demands with athletic departments and marketing, it's tough to keep that tradition going. And um, sometimes it causes me to have to say no a lot to a lot of requests, but it's a tradition that's um, synonymous with Penn State it sticks with us and um, mascots across the country think that it's amazing that we have one student who's selected to be our mascot because at most schools they have up anywhere between five and nine students as the mascot at Penn State we keep it at one because that's our tradition. Uh, Julie for you how many extra practice sessions or uh, do you practice more when you're in football season or um, do you practice more leading up to nationals kind of what does a uh, what does a week look like for the student athletes in your program? Yeah, so a typical week, kind of not during the pandemic, would consist of uh, four three hour practices a week, so twelve hours a week. Um, leading up to nationals, we do add practices. Nationals nationals is typically in January, so um, we stick around over winter break, over Thanksgiving break, and add practices in there. Um, and then we just do the best we can with the time we have um, football season and nationals and um, basketball, that perfect storm when they all collide. It's a crazy time for us. But I think that my dancers kind of thrive off of that um, being really busy and being under deadlines. So we make it work. Great. So, absolutely. So our time is running out for this segment, but PJ, I want to give you an opportunity to kind of plug everything you guys are doing during the week leading up to game day and, and some of the special things that you're doing on game day. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Um, uh, so we, we kick everything off on Tuesdays pretty much. We have the, the coach Franklin press conference, which some, some of you um, are, are probably at. Um, I know, I know John's probably there, uh, John Patishnock and John Black probably. Um, but that, that is on uh, Tuesdays. That's on um, that's on our Facebook page. On Wednesday nights, we do something now called the game preview, which we, which is when the media meets with Coach Franklin directly after practice, immediately after practice. We now push that to our Facebook Live and our Twitter Live pages. When I say that, it's our football page, so um, you can you can follow that football page 
on Facebook or Twitter and get that. It's also on gopsusports.com. If, if you're not into social media, then you can head there. And we had Coach on for, for um, his, his time with the media. And then we, uh, we have Mitch Gerber, our GoPSU Sports host, and Steve Jones, the voice of the Nittany Lions, uh, run that. And then on Saturday mornings, like I said, 8 a.m., bright and early before game day starts, we are all over Happy Valley. We will have um, we, all sorts of folks featured. This week, I just answered somebody's question. Uh, James Franklin will be on. Nick Scott from the LA Rams will be on. Military folks from all across Happy Valley, not even involved with just Penn State Athletics. I'm talking what ROTC is doing at 3 in the morning and a little bit more in-depth stuff of that, what the Michael P. Murphy War Memorial or Plaza is and really focus on those types of things that make PSU so special. Um, that's at 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. That's the best thing we got going. I, I take a lot of pride in that one. I think that one's so much fun. It's, it's Penn State pride uh, to a T. And then finally, after the game, uh, after the win that John Black said earlier that we're going to get this weekend, we have the post-game show. So we'll have a live shot in the tunnel of the guys leaving the field after they ring the victory bell. Um, and, then, uh, and then we'll head it over to James uh, Coach Franklin's press conference, and then Mitch will have some of our Mitch Gerber will have some of our players. So, all that's on Facebook and Twitter and Go PSU Sports, and uh, we will absolutely Greg Drain on last week, and Maria Taylor and Chris Fowler from Game Day. We will absolutely at some point get Coach White and Coach Berardi on there, and uh, if we're lucky, we'll talk to John Black's people and get him on too to break it down for us. <laughs> that is great. Hey, thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, it's so good to see you all. I miss you all. And I uh, wish we had more time to visit, but, but thanks for joining us on Football Letter Live. That's great. Thank you. I miss thank you, you all. John. See you. Thank thanks, you. John. Thanks, Paul. See you, Julie. Thank Shika. you. Bye. Bye. John, it's always special to visit with friends like that, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, the, the young people just have so much uh, spirit and put so much energy into everything that they do. Uh, for Penn State. That's just great to see it. Well, hey, speaking of energy, next up, we're thrilled to welcome Rich Gardner, letterman with Penn State football team, 1999 to 2002. He was a defensive back with the Nittany Lions. Rich was selected in the third round of the NFL draft by Tennessee and played two seasons with the Titans playing cornerbacks and special teams. Currently, Rich is a performance coach, a community leader. He's the co-founder of a nonprofit called Maroon Village. We're going to talk to him a little bit about that tonight. Uh, and so it's great to welcome Rich from, Rich, I think you're joining us from Gary, Indiana. Uh, yes, yeah, Northwest Indiana, outside of uh, Gary and uh, Chesterton, Indiana. Well, welcome home to Happy Valley virtually. Absolutely. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Rich, take us back to your recruiting process and tell us how you became a Penn State Nittany Lion. Uh, so um, I had an article second week of my junior year. It was called uh, Hard Ro uh, Road Travel. But uh, my recruiting process was uh, just that. And this is before the services that we have, the platforms we have, social media and Huddle. I don't know if you're familiar with Huddle, but this is a platform where student athletes and coaches use for film and other, uh, you know, stats that collegiate coaches can access. But I ended up walking on. I walked on at Penn State. And uh, just being a, a long time fan of football, college football. And, um, you know, just talked to my dad and just really wanted the opportunity to showcase my talent at the next level. So we did everything we could to make that possible. Right. Yeah. You, yeah, you did indeed start as a walk on, uh, but you uh, eventually earned third team all American honors uh, as a great uh, cornerback for us. What were some of the keys, uh, Rich, that you remember that allowed you to grow into that role on the field at Penn State? Uh, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, I still kind of wrestle with that to today, but um you know, I just, I think naturally I had that intrinsic motivation that we all speak about, you know, and knowing that, hey, you know, there's no such thing as failure, you know, and just knowing like, hey, you have to keep it going. You know, you're going to fall, you're going to fail, but, you know, when it comes to perfecting the craft, when it comes to enjoying something that you love, it's all about the journey. So just 
kind of honing in on that throughout. And I also had great coaches that, uh, that I was surrounded by in high school. And of course, Joe Paterno kind of fell into that opportunity. So I had great guidance and leadership. There are a lot of exciting things that happen during a football game. But I don't think that there's really much more exciting things that happen than a pick six. Uh, when we think back, we play Nebraska next week. Um, and, and I can remember the 2002 game against Nebraska, middle of the third quarter, game still hanging in the balance. Um, and you, you have the ball come your way, and, uh, and, and you take that interception all the way to the house. Talk a little bit about that moment, right? Probably your most iconic moment in Penn State history. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I remember that game like it was yesterday. But, uh, you know, to make a long story short, um, you know, we was not on the same page as far as the defense. The linemen, linebackers played a different defense in the secondary. So to this day, no one know what the actual defense that was called. Even Tom Bradley, even Scrap, he <laughs> have no idea what was called. But that was a pretty intense game. That crowd at that time broke the record for most attendance. Right. So the energy was just in, insane. So it just kind of all worked out. <laughs> you were there at the right time and the right place. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, again, I had a great defensive line at that time, you know. So talk about uh, Michael Haynes. Um, uh, Jim Ball, Jim Kennedy, you know, Spice, Anthony Adams. So I had a great line that helped me out as well. Yeah. Well, that, that, that interception and that particular game are mentioned often when fans discuss the, some of the most iconic uh, moments and games in Beaver Stadium history. Uh, was there a point uh, over the years when you realized that uh, it's just more than a, a, a big moment that uh, that uh, moment for you would uh, sometime be a lasting memory for you as well as many other alumni and fans. Um, yeah, you know, so I would share one story, you know, on one of my uh, visits to Penn State. I try to come out to Penn State when I can. And I ran into uh, a freshman at that time. And he mentioned how he was younger and he saw my interception and that inspired him to attend Penn State. So moments like that, stories like that, you know, just kind of, you know, had me reflect and think about how impactful that moment was. And just to add uh, to the story, Coach Norwood, who was a safety coach, his no, son, no, no. Jordan Norwood, who actually played in, if, in the NFL as a wide receiver, uh, great talent. He was actually in the end zone when I scored. Oh my God. <laughs> and uh, cheering me on. And you can see him in the background of some of the pictures. So I'm pretty sure that moment inspired him to dominate the gridiron as well. So, um, yeah, very impactful moment. That's awesome. You know, Rich, I'm thinking back to your time at Penn State. And I'm even thinking back to the, the year before this 2001, kind of a. Um, uh, a season in Penn State football that sticks out in our memory for so many reasons, right? Um, we all remember Adam Talaferro coming out of the tunnel the first game of the year and then the second game of the year being postponed because of 9-11. But when we were preparing for this show, you mentioned that you were actually Adam's roommate in 2000 uh, at that Ohio State game um, in which he, was, which he was significantly injured in. Talk a little bit about your relationship with Adam and, and what it was like to be in the stadium that night he came out of the tunnel. Oh, that was amazing. That was absolutely amazing. But to uh, kind of rewind to that incident, um, I was actually Adam's uh, roommate the night before the injury. So usually Joe Paterno don't allow freshmen to play. Uh, he made an exception this one particular year because we was kind of thin on talent. So he allowed Adam to not only travel, but to play. And uh, we roomed that night. And, um, you know, just it's a lot of things in life you don't see coming, you know. But, um, you know, the sweet part of it is to see, as I said before, people overcome what we perceive as failure. You know, someone that we said won't be able to walk anymore. And not only doing, not only is he walking out the tunnel, but he went 
uh, even further. And um, he, had, he has a law degree now. And he is a practicing professional. And it's just amazing to, you know, hear his story. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you talked about uh, what it was like playing for Joe Paterno. Do you have a favorite story about uh, uh, Coach Paterno? And how, how, how would you describe what it was like playing uh, in his program? Uh, Again, I'm glad uh, my parents surrounded me with the coaches that they did because I was, uh, you know, able to really adjust to um, the structure, I'm gonna call it, of Joe Paterno, you know? And one thing I really appreciate, appreciate about Joe Paterno is the fact that he cared. He cared about everyone and his actions demonstrated that. So that's what really separate him as far as coaches that you know, I have experienced throughout my career, uh, Joe Paterno cared. And uh, just to sum it up, I'm a walk on from Chicago. So at that time, I was not a big time recruit, you know, and to be honest, Adam Talaferro and another uh, freshman, uh, Gerald uh, Smith, he, they actually was in front of me on a depth chart, you know, so I was behind everyone. So with that said, uh, I was walking to class and I had a, my hat and earring. So of course there was an earring and uh, it was earring policy and we couldn't have earrings. So um, I'm walking to class and this is on campus, so far away from the dorms. And I hear someone, you know, pull up on me and say, hey, Godna, and that's my last name. And that's how, you know, Joe Paterno's high pitched voice say, hey, Godna. And I looked and said, hey coach, he said, take out those earrings. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, and I'm thinking like, man, I'm just a walk on. I'm not even a scholarship player. And, you know, but he cared about me enough to kind of get on me about my uh, dress code. And he just was really diligent about uh, certain ethics at the school. And, you know, this is one of it, you know, uniform and, and other things attached to that. So I really appreciate it. That's just a, a one small story of many stories that I appreciate about Joe Paterno. You know, our fans, they remember your time in the NFL, but our fans go next level on their research. We have a question coming in here. A uh, fan wants to know, what was your experience like playing for the Kiel Hurricanes and leading them to a German Bowl championship? Did you run into many Penn Staters when you were in Germany? <laughs> That's an excellent question, excellent research. So that actually propelled me into my nonprofit career, my experience in Germany, and that was amazing. And it's amazing what football can do. And football really crossed international borders. But uh, I did not know that Germany had the highest percentage of American football fans. So um, that was a surprise. And they actually funded their own league, GFL. So people think that the NFL Europe was part of the Kill Hurricanes. Well, no, this was actual league that was supported by uh, Germany, you know. And um, I was out there as a coach, as well as a player. So as a coach, I was able to work with the defensive players and we actually turned their record around, which was a junior team. They was 0-8 the year before. And when I coached along with my American buddies, uh, they was 8-0 and and led the league in all defensive categories, of course. And um, <laughs> playing for the uh, Kill Hurricanes, I was amazing, I was defensive captain. Uh, I was switched as a safety. So the safety being a quarterback of the defense, and that was a great time. Um, just really um, kind of blending in with the culture and just making great friends and just using, you know, football as a mode of communication. So that was an excellent time out there, and I enjoyed it. You said that propelled you into your nonprofit um, that you have started. Talk a little bit about the mission of Maroon Village. Uh, great. I appreciate that. So uh, Maroon Village, you can find us at uh, hellomaroonvillage.org, but uh, it was inspired by the Jamaican Maroons, and I kind of created, uh, and I'll get back into that backdrop later, but uh, what we do at Maroon Village is cultivate healthy environments uh, to promote resiliency, and we use performance training and yoga. So the unique aspect of our program is we cater to um, uh, demographics in the city, under resourced communities in the city. And um, people may not know, but when it comes to issues that we're facing collectively, 
uh, densely populated areas face a unique challenge that's outside of areas that might not be as dense. So we have more of a resource issue and this resource can spill over to education and health and wellness. So what we do at Maroon Village is teach uh, athletes how to hone in um, with self. We use a lot of mindfulness um, uh, teaching in our practice. Uh, we do, uh, you know, a lot of meditation. And the reason why we do this is, you know, to really address a lot of the resistance that exists in the cities, the trauma that athletes go through. So not only do I create performance training programs, but I also help student athletes manage stress, which is important, especially at the grade school, high school level. Kids are really developing. And there's, uh, you know, the brain is sensitive at that, you know, so I don't want to get into the science of it, but, you know, it's very important to have a safe space for uh, student athletes. So that's our main focus. And within that safe space, we create programming to help them kind of hone in on the craft and do that through, again, like I said, mindful practice, which is breath work and those things. So hope I hope you got all that. Yeah. <laughs> What, what, what are some of the goals, the future goals uh, that you've set uh, for Maroon Village and things that you're hoping to accomplish uh, in the near future? Uh, great question. So uh, what we do is set up kids so that they do flourish as uh, collegiate athletes. All of the kids that we work with do, do want to further themselves as student athletes. So we set up, uh, you know, programming so that they do accomplish that. So of course we have to pay attention to things like uh, grades, you know, and um, uh, proficiency when it comes to uh, certain subject uh, subjects and whatnot. So um, we kind of customize things. We make sure kids have tutors. Um, and interesting enough, we work with artists as well. So we got athletes who are artists. So um, it's, it's the one good thing about what we do is just the creative input that we have and working with the high schools and the um, organizations in Chicago and now Gary. So having a good time with that. And one more thing, we have now expanded internationally uh, with friend uh, and colleague Munya. I don't know if you know Munya, but he was a walk-on of the Penn State football team. Yes. He uh, was a track uh, scholarship athlete from Zimbabwe. Right. So uh, we actually work with him to bring our program to South Africa. So uh, we're doing some interesting things, and I appreciate uh, using football as a means. You know, Richard, I, I think of the student athletes that you're involved with and um, kind of the unique course of training that you're taking them through. And and the role that you play, right? You're a guy who played in the league, that they look up to you. You serve as a mentor for these students. Um, I know we didn't plan on asking, the, asking this question, but I, I hope it's okay if I take it in this direction. Yeah. I'm sure you got a lot of questions this summer around the Black Lives Matter movement and, and around um, some of the things that, that your student athletes were thinking about. Talk us, take us through what that conversation looks like uh, from you as a mentor working with student athletes and uh, maybe the platform and how they can speak out in, in ways that are, that are productive and strong to help move the movement forward. To, to give us a little insight on your, your conversations with your student athletes around the movement. Awesome, I really appreciate you bringing that up. But uh, with the Black Lives Matter movement, I think that that served as a platform for all organizations and individuals to kind of like use to kind of leverage their own idea of equality inclusion, you know? So when it comes to Black Lives Matter and when people talk about race and racism, what we try to do at Maroon Village is kind of deconstruct the language and kind of use different language in our programming. So not trying to push things aside, but really attack it for them what it is, you know? And that is the lack of resources that is in these communities. You know what I mean? The lack of investment in education. You know what I mean? The socioeconomic disparities, disparities that's brought about by organizations and companies that come and take resources away. 
So when we address these things, we address it with an approach to say, hey, you know, these are some things that you can do to leverage that. You know, you're a student athlete. Well, you have to know that you are an enterprise and in being an enterprise, you have to take care of yourself in a way that you can leverage your strength in order to have access to resources. So what we try to do is empower and the way we empower is kind of use language that the kids can understand, you know, like, oh, all right, well, I understand that if I work, uh, you know, short term, you know, um, uh, I will get to this point and long term, you know, I will be at some school or university, you know, and just going um, and just leaving the community is what I try to do for the most part, uh, just push kids away and do so um, knowing that they will kind of um, have that experience that is necessary in order to address these issues that they are facing in their communities. So now, you know, instead of the um, the language that we use in our, I don't want to use the word politics, but I got to use it because it's just so, um, uh, you know, just so detached. Right. It's so detached and a lot of people just feel alienated when they uh, get into these conversations. So uh, don't want to alienate these kids, want to speak to them like they are human beings. And that's what I try to promote when it comes to addressing issues and uh, movements like Black Lives Matter. You know, as, as I listen to your answer, Richard, it, it's hard for me not to think back to, you know, you referenced Coach Paterno. I, I wonder if you hear his voice in your head uh, on a daily basis, because you could, you could just be focused on training the student athlete, on, on training the athlete to go off and kind of reach peak performance and, and then go off and perform athletically. But the holistic approach that you're taking, where you're looking at providing tutors and, and helping them on the academic side, right? Um, uh, you, you're really talking about the, the full person uh, that you're working with through Maroon Village. And it just sounds like, you know, that's what Joe did, right? You can't win on the yeah. field if you're not winning in the classroom and not winning in the community. Um, do, do you feel that? Do you, do you hear? Um, is that part of the influence of what you're doing? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think uh, Joe Paterno had a strong moral foundation and it spilled everywhere. And he was just naturally, um, you know, focused on that holistic approach. You know, people talk about him giving money to the paternal, uh, to, to the paternal library. And, you know, when it comes to how he uh, manage the team. You know, we had mandatory breakfast. We had dress code. Um, uh, we had dress code. Uh, he didn't allow scouts in practices. And I had no idea why, you know. And now as an adult, I get it because it's not about that, you know. And that was my uh, pitfall going to NFL and coming back to my community. I found that, you know, there's a lot of work to be done when it comes to coaching and training athletes, you know, and I didn't have all of the answers and it took me some time to be invested. And, you know, I'm at a point now where I see, you know, the difference and I see what Joe Paterno was talking about. He was invested in the person and the wins just came, you know, and that's hard for people to kind of grasp in today's time where, you know, the need for short-term results is immediate, you know, when, money, you know, so it's, I was fortunate to have someone like Joe Paterno with the humility and with the, uh, with the, with a solid moral compass. Well, we're, we're so happy that uh, you had that opportunity to have the experience at Penn State and other, under the tutelage of a man as great as Joe Paterno. And we're also think it's great that you are going back now to your original community in the Chicago area and doing what you can to uh, make opportunities available for youngster people, uh, youngsters coming from underprivileged areas. It's been a great, uh, great learning experience, I'm sure for you and you're giving them a great learning experience now in return. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And hopefully, you know, I have some of my athletes ask me like, hey, I want to go to Penn State, you know, <laughs> yeah. so I'd be happy. Um, and actually, that's part of our uh, plan as well. Um, I'm good friends with Wally Richardson. So, oh, yeah. um, you know, the, I do have uh, plans to bring student athletes to Penn State and just for a visit, you know, uh, that means a lot for the student athletes to get away, as I mentioned before, and to kind of uh, visualize themselves as students. And that's one thing people kind of miss is that a lot of young people from these dense populated areas cannot see themselves outside of their uh, limitations that's, you know, that's in front of them, those barriers that we talk about. So a uh, trip to Penn State, a trip to Happy Valley is that, that you know, that tangible, you know, experience that they could be like, hey, I could be a student, I can do this. Right. Absolutely. Well, hey, next time you do that, uh, hit us up and we'll make sure we get them a campus tour with Lion Ambassadors and um, and get them S-Zone t-shirts and, and really welcome them to Penn State and make sure they have a great experience. I'll do that. I'm going to shoot you guys an email. All right, Richard. Hey, you're doing some great work. Your accomplishments are certainly swelling thy fame of dear old state. And for that, we're truly grateful. Keep up the great work. And thanks for joining us on Football Letter Live. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Penn State yeah. Alumni Association. You guys are wonderful. Take Thank care, you. Richard. All right. Take care. Good night. Good night. <laughs> so before we let everyone go, we wanted to let you know that the uh, Football Letter blog, this week we are going to be highlighting the 1994 season. You can read the feature on thefootballletter.com. If you're a member of the Penn State Alumni Association, thank you so much for your support. We truly appreciate it. If you're not, go to our website at alumni.psu.edu and you too can become a member of the world's largest alumni association. Uh, John, you know, it was, it was great to, uh, what a great show. I mean, the, the people we've had on are, were just so inspiring and it's great to catch up with Richard. It is, and, and he's representative of so many other uh, student athletes that uh, are now making their uh, mark as alumni and doing good things for others. Absolutely, you know, it's, um, you know, success with honor can just be a slogan, but when you talk to players like that, you know that uh, it's, it's people like him and his teammates and Letterman all over the world that bring that success with honor to life, and so... Um, it, it's more than just a slogan here at Penn State, for sure. And we have more coming up in the future, too. Absolutely. Yeah. Speaking of the future, join us next week right here on the Football Letter live show as we welcome Penn State Letterman Alan Zamatis and Gary Gilliam. Also on the schedule uh, next week, uh, nine o'clock in the morning, Wednesday coffee hour, we will welcome alumna Heather Neary. Heather is the president of Auntie Anne's Pretzels. I love Auntie Anne's pretzels. I, I, I stop at them. Uh, I'm, there's, there's one when I'm driving back from Michigan State, right when you cross the border into Ohio, there's one there at the rest area. Uh, and it, it's always a stop for me on the way back from Michigan State. But she's the president of Auntie Anne's, which is a, a wonderful company based in, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. We look forward to sharing her story with uh, the Penn Staters. Uh, Again, you can find more information about uh, career resources, about more virtual programs that are coming up in the future, all on our website at alumni.psu.edu. Well, don't, again. You have, don't you have John Amici coming up tomorrow? John Amici tomorrow. Yes, tomorrow Great. at noon, a special edition of Coffee Hour. John, thanks for reminding me. Great. Uh, he's, uh, he's got an amazing story. He's such an inspirational uh, speaker John, you might fans out there might know, remember John from his time on the basketball court well, at Penn State back in the late '90s. Uh, back in yeah, in the late '90s, and then went on to an NBA career, and is now really? uh, just doing some great things in his professional life. And we look forward to sharing his story on Coffee Hour tomorrow at noon on so noon Friday. Tune into that. More information on our website. Thank you for all you do for the university, for the glory, and for the future. We are Penn State.